this morning. Ken Livingston, Shirley Williams, David Meller, and in Newcastle, Tony Blair. Um, Tony Blair, the, um, what's your analysis of the reason for Labour's defeat? We had a tremendous leap to come from, from 1987 to actually win an overall majority. We, of course, took many, many seats. I mean, our sense of disappointment, obvious sense of disappointment, must be balanced by the sense of achievement that we took so many seats in different parts of the country. But it was too much to do, so it now appears, to come from where we were in 1987 to actually win an overall majority. But we have vastly reduced the Conservative majority, down from what around about 100 seats to less than a fifth of that. And I think, too, that what else is very positive in this campaign for us was that in many ways the agenda was ours. Could it be that John Major read the public mood on, the, on tax far better than you did? He now, saw instinctively that when people told the pollsters they were willing to pay more tax and have better public services, they were not telling the whole truth. No, I think it was that, in some ways, the Conservatives, I think most people believed, did not deserve to win the election. But the question was ultimately whether people were prepared to come sufficiently in sufficiently great numbers for the Labour Party, for Labour actually to win power. And as I say, if you actually look at the number of seats we gained, it was very considerable. If you look at the number of seats the Conservatives lost, it was very considerable. But um, coming from where we were yeah. back in the, the first defeat of 83 and then 87, we couldn't make, make that final leap, not in the sufficient numbers that we required to win an overall majority or indeed to put the Conservatives out of office. Now, of course, that's a tremendous disappointment. It would be rather strange if it wasn't to us, since we fought, in many ways, a very good campaign. But I do think it should be balanced and measured against that sense of achievement and also the fact that we won seats in all parts of the country. We won seats down in the southwest, we won seats in London, which I think is very important, and, of course, we won seats in the northwest and Midlands and the north of two. Now that Mr Kinnock is a two-time loser, does he have your unqualified support as leader for as yes. long as he wants to go yeah. on? That is not even on the agenda today. And let me tell you something about the campaign that Neil Kinnock fought. It was a brilliant campaign. He earned the gratitude and respect of many people, not just in the Labour Party, but throughout the country. I spent quite a long time with them during the course of that campaign, and I saw it firsthand the absolutely superb job of leadership that he did and he has our tremendous respect and gratitude and support. Let me put the same question to Ken Livingston. Does Neil Kinnock have your unqualified support as leader for as long as he wants to go on? Yes, we don't want to get into a leadership struggle. We don't want to say one person is to blame. The whole movement is to blame for this defeat. This is the election where power was really in our hands and we let it slip away. No government in the last 60 years, in any Western democracy, has gone through a recession as severe as this and been re-elected. Therefore, I think Tony's wrong, and he's been very optimistic. We should have had a commanding majority, perhaps over 100 seats, which is what the, the economic factors but would where, have led to. Where does the blame lie? Put your finger on it. I think it, it, the, whole, the whole party has moved too far to the right, been too frightened to challenge vested interests. We also didn't have our, our sums add up in all of this. We didn't say we were going to cut defence spending. We didn't say we were going to have any constraints on the export of capital abroad. We said we'd spend more on investment in industry, more on pensions, and people could see those figures couldn't add up. As soon as Labour decided it wasn't going to reduce military spending, you were ined led inevitably into this tax quagmire. And I found across London and the South East where the average male earnings are 20,000 a year, that fatal mistake of saying, well, national insurance contributions at 21,000, you're going to have to start paying, meant the average voter in, in the South East felt our tax policies were hitting him, not the filthy capitalist class, just the ordinary middle income family. What do you say to that, Tony Blair? I don't accept that, that the shadow budget was a mistake in any way at all. Indeed, I think it was generally regarded as one of the coups of the campaign. It set the agenda for a lot of the time. Eight out of ten families gained under Labour's proposals. And I think that in terms of the economic agenda, many of the issues that were fought in the campaign were fought very much on our territory. And I do think you have to remember the tremendous uphill struggle that we had. Indeed, I remember people saying not so many months ago, never mind several years ago, that the task was enormous. Well, we accomplished a lot. We didn't accomplish enough. But I believe that John Smith's shadow budget was very successful indeed. Shirley Williams, your reaction to the end of the SDP? Rosie well, Barnes and John Cartwright oh, going I, down the tube. Yes, I mean, 
personal sadness, especially with respect to John Cartwright, who was a first-rate constituency MP. I think it was not helped by David Owen's last-minute uh, declaration that uh, people should vote Conservative, mm. uh, because I think John Cartwright's was fundamentally a Labour constituency that he held by sheer devotion to constituency work. But let me say one other thing as well. I think that I think one of the things that happened in the last few days was both that Labour's vote crumbled vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Conservatives and so to some extent did ours. And I think one reason for that was because of things like the Sheffield rally, which suddenly showed Neil Kinnock in a triumphalist mode. And I think many people, even now, are frightened of a Kinnock government. That, that Sheffield rally was the sort of American politics that Michael Foote was just condemning. Yes, but I, oh, of course. No, I'm not saying it helped. I think it didn't help. Actually, I don't agree with Michael. I don't think this is a very American style of campaign. I think there was an awful lot of grassroots work. I think that the moment when John uh, Major took his to his soapbox was the exact moment when he fought back with what one might call an English style of campaigning. I have to say, I think Paddy Ashton's campaign was also brilliant. But at the last analysis, people simply stubbornly resisted the idea of a Labour government. Do you think there's time now for another realignment, yet another realignment in opposition? Yes, I think probably, because I think what's going to happen is that we're going to get into very, very heavy economic waters. Oh. I think what's happening in Japan is probably more relevant to what's going to happen in the next year than anything we've seen so far about the election. I think that's going to mean that the Conservatives are governing at a time of probably deepening economic gloom, and that's going to force Labour and I think uh, the Liberal Democrats into looking at the whole role of opposition. And one final point, I actually believe British democracy can only work if you have changes of government. I think it's very frightening to have four governments, one on top of the other. I don't mind what the colour of that government is, because we don't have an underpinning of constitutional uh, rights which would enable us to live through a period of single government. And we're very close to single party government, in, at least in England and Wales at the present time. Does one party state worry you, David Miller? Well, I, I understand what Shirley is saying, that obviously in a sophisticated democracy, power transfers. I think the story of this election is that actually quite a lot of people looked at that. I think the high number of don't knows at the beginning of the campaign was a sign of people looking probably for exactly those reasons of whether they should make a change. And I think that they peered into the abyss of a Neil Kinnock government and drew back. And that was the, what was behind the late swing. Uh, I think, frankly, if tri driven to a choice, I think democracy is better sustained by four conservative terms than taking a punt with Neil Kinnock. Do you think any party will ever go to the country again promising to increase taxes? Well, I don't know. But, you know, I think that what you know, I don't agree with what uh, Ken Livingston says on policy, but I admire Ken's honesty and candour in a party that seems to have lost the ability to be honest or candid. Somebody once said, could, could anybody write a good book about the present policy stance of the Labour Party? And of course they couldn't. The Labour Party, in its desperation to get into office, lost its soul. It said things for the soundbite. And I think actually that Sheffield rally did actually sum up where Labour had got to. A lot of empty glitz, like Oscars without anyone having done anything to deserve an award. And actually, um, you know, people looked at it and saw it was empty as a sort of Easter egg, you know, nicely wrapped, totally hollow in the middle. And I think, you know, Neil Kinnock's bandwagon has become a tumbrel. David Meller, Tony Blair, Ken Livingston, Shirley Williams, for now, thank you very much.